Okay, before we get into chapter 2.3, let's do some review. So we have Madhu, who comes into a clinic experiencing a fever, rash, and high blood pressure. He is experiencing A, symptoms, B, signs, C, signs and symptoms, or D, a syndrome. Go ahead and pause the video, think about that one. Okay, the answer would be signs, because these are all things that an external observer can measure, right? We can measure temperature, we can see that rash, and we can measure high blood pressure. Uh, is it a syndrome? Well, these are so vague that I don't think they would be classified as a syndrome, because there are so many things that all have this. Um, so signs would be the best answer here. Okay, so we've talked about uh, infectious agents, how we kind of measure them, and then we talked about disease. Now we're going to talk about infectious cycles and disease transmission. So part of our infectious disease is that it can move from one host to another, right? Whatever causes it, that microbe can spread disease, right? That's the big thing here. Diseases can spread. Infectious diseases can spread is the big thing versus something like diabetes. You can't really spread that person to person. Uh, so we're going to describe complex versus simple infection cycles, and we'll see a few ex general examples. Uh, when we come to parasites later in the course, they have the craziest infection cycles. They go from like, uh, you know, toxoplasma goes into cats and rats and then can get into humans. And there's all kinds of crazy steps in there. Um, we're going to differentiate between uh, terms we use for endemic disease versus an epidemic disease versus a pandemic disease. Those are different terms, and we've heard some of them. We'll talk about animal reservoirs and incubators. Okay, let's start with a case history here. So we have Emma. She's in college, uh, and she's attending school in Massachusetts, and uh, started to feel sick during one of her classes. By the time she gets back to her residence hall, uh, she's got a fever, nausea, headache, and body aches. General uh, signs and symptoms, right? A lot of things cause that. She thinks it's the flu, uh, so she tries to stay in bed. And then she starts to notice that a rash is showing up. So you can see this spotty rash here, right? Uh, if we want to get real technical, they are small, flat, pink, non-itching spots, right? Uh, that means they're not raised, they got a certain color, and they don't itch. So this starts to tell us more about what's going on. Okay, so she goes to the health center and the PA talks to her about what she's been doing, right? It's really critical. We see the signs and symptoms. We want to know what people have been doing, where they've been, who they've been with, what they've been doing with them, uh, what they've been eating, drinking. All these things can help us narrow down what might be going on. So she tells the physician assistant uh, she took a trip about three weeks earlier to North Carolina uh, where she'd hiked and camped in the woods. Her friend had noticed a tick on her, uh, but picked it off and threw it away. So her signs and symptoms uh, led the PA to suspect Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, sounds kind of accurate, right? Uh, this is caused by a bacterium, Rickettsia rickettsii. No one else on her trip had this, and no one back at her college has it. So how did Emma get this disease? Well, the tick, right? It's a tick-borne infection. So it's uh, what we call a vector-borne infection. That's the mode of transmission. But what actually happens here? Well, this bacteria, Rickettsia rickettsii, uh, it causes the disease. The tick is like an intermediate. The tick goes out and takes a blood meal from, say, a deer, and that deer might have this bacteria in it. And so the, the tick takes the blood in, and now it's got the bacteria in it, and then it moves on and goes and bites a human. And some of that bacteria comes with it when it bites it and infects us. So that tick, in this case, didn't really cause the disease. It's what we call a vector, something that moves the causative bacteria from one organism to another. And this is our mode of transmission. Interestingly, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever identified in the Rocky Mountains, but actually very common to the East Coast. 
So we're going to talk all about modes of transmission. We have a few different ones that we'll go through. This is just our overview here. Uh, direct transmission, indirect transmission, vertical transmission, and then vector-borne transmission, which involves some sort of animal reservoir and then uh, arthropods, which are insects and arachnids, moving uh, the um, a bacteria or whatever uh, agent organism from the reservoir into humans. Okay, so we have a lot of terms here again, right? Uh, and, and these are important ones for describing things when we talk about vector-borne diseases. Uh, we want to know what the vector is, mosquitoes and West Nile virus. Uh, we went on a hike a couple of weeks ago and got bit by about a million mosquitoes. And uh, we're interested if uh, West Nile was in Idaho. It is uh, low, low number, but still, mosquitoes are a vector for that. Um, Fecal oral route, it's just what it sounds like. Um, so this is a huge one in human pathogens, and there's so many factors that go into this, um, including uh, you know food security and wastewater treatment, proper sanitation, proper hygiene. Uh, this is a super common one. Some way that feces exits the body with pathogens in it and contaminates food, water, or an object, which we call a fomite, and then the pathogen gets into a new host by ingesting it. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about um, endemic diseases, epidemics, and pandemics, um, other routes we'll talk about in a moment. So let's look at these modes of transmission. Well, uh, the route of transmission from one person or animal to another, we call that the infection cycle, right? Uh, goes from you to your partner, or maybe from your cat to you, uh, whatever. Uh, this would be an example of what we call horizontal transmission from one individual to another um, down the line. We also have a case called vertical transmission, which is pretty specialized where an infectious agent is transferred from a parent to an offspring. This often happens uh, in, in females during pregnancy. Um, it could be that it could go across the placenta or through the actual birthing process itself. Uh, there are many diseases that can be transmitted this way. So that would be vertical transmission. Um, also, some e insects and arthropods do vertical transmission as well. Okay, so direct transmission. This is like touching, right? Direct contact. So uh, this is a pretty simple one, right? Usually um, organisms may spread directly from person to person, touching, kissing, sex, right, direct physical contact. And we're actually seeing right now an outbreak of monkeypox, um, which is uh, caused by direct contact, um, generally through sexual contact. We also have indirect modes of transmission. Uh, that could be uh, through from a living organism into the air or something um, onto inanimate objects we call fomites. These are just general things. My, my pen here, my phone, right? I touch my phone, I give it to someone else, they stick it on their face, right? That's indirect transmission. Um, vehicles such as food and water, we contaminate those. The air, right? This is why during the COVID pandemic, we ask people to wear masks because the viral particles get transmitted indirectly in these respiratory droplets, those aerosol droplets. Vectors are technically an indirect uh, transmission, ticks and mosquitoes. And I mentioned that fecal oral route, right? This is a big one, contaminating food and water um, with feces. Uh, organic farming has a bit of a problem with this because the greatest organic fertilizer is, of course, feces, uh, manure in a lot of cases, but if you use human uh, feces as a fertilizer, which some underdeveloped countries still do, that completes a lot of pathogen life cycles because you put it on your crops and then if you can't wash your crops well enough, you eat it and then it completes the life cycle. Now, uh, we have some places that we call reservoirs. A reservoir is an animal uh, 
could be including humans, or an environment that harbors the pathogen. So the pathogen lives there and is normally there, and then it gets transmitted to the host, generally us. This could be something like an asymptomatic carrier um, that harbors a potential disease agent, but doesn't actually have the disease. Um, this makes treating things very hard. Uh, we have um, Neisseria meningitis, uh, which is a bacteria that causes meningitis, which is an, inf uh, an infection of the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, it doesn't have an animal reservoir, but it's actually maintained in the human population. A certain percentage of people don't actually get sick when they have this, but they can transmit it to uh, other individuals. Uh, so, yeah, we have reservoirs. These are places that the pathogens are normally kind of hanging out in, and they don't always cause disease in those organisms. A lot of animal uh, uh, bacteria don't cause disease in the animal, but then when it gets transmitted to us, it causes some sort of disease. Now, a classic case here is what we call the third pandemic. So we're gonna we're gonna tell a story here. In 1884, Yang Ding, he's 38 and he lives in Canton in southern China. Um, he's got a hard life, right? Uh, he's a cook, but he can support his family. So right now, disease is rampant in 1884, and we have what's going on called Shu Yi. Uh, the rat epidemic and we have bodies basically stacked in the street being uh, you know waiting for burial um, okay so there's some sort of disease going on people think that it involves rats right because it seems to come around when there are rats around so Yang Ding notices the first signs of this disease in himself a swelling in his armpit uh, within a couple days, he starts coughing up blood uh, as whatever's causing this, they didn't know at the time, it spreads through his bloodstream and to his lungs. So once he saw this swelling, which we call bubo, uh, once he saw that, he knew he was dead, right? That's, that's one of the signs that indicates that once people get that, they die. And in this case, more than 60,000 people died during this third pandemic. And in this case, it was a bubonic plague, which also caused the Black Death. It's caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. And uh, rats are the, thought to be the reservoir. Um, but, right, the pathogen is actually transmitted by a flea vector. So the rat has it in its blood and the bacteria multiplies to a super high level. Uh, this is septicemia. Then the flea comes along, takes a blood meal from the rat, gets the bacteria in its gut, and then it hops off and jumps onto a human, takes a blood meal from us, but some of that blood gets regurgitated back out. So some of the rat blood goes into us, transmitting the bacteria, and now it's in us. Without antibiotics, you die in a couple days from this. And uh, there have been several pandemics of this. The Black Death killed the, like a third of Europe's population in the 14th century. And actually, uh, the bubonic plague is still technically uh, found, and there is an epidemic of it in Madagascar. So several years ago, I went to a conference in Madagascar because I was working on fleas and with Yersinia pestis, um, studying this, how the flea reacts to it. And there are still uh, several hundred cases of plague each year in Madagascar. So um, there are still active cases of this. Luckily, we have antibiotics now that can treat this. So that brings us to how do we describe disease in an area? Well, we have three terms, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. An endemic disease is one that is always present at a low level in a community. And this is often something that's like found in an uh, animal reservoir, right? So um, something like, I don't know, the flu is endemic generally to certain regions at certain times, right? It's only when the number of cases increases rapidly in a short period of time in a community, we call that an epidemic, right? So um, it's always present kind of at this low level, and suddenly cases jump up, right? That's what we would call an epidemic. Once that starts to spread worldwide, we call that a pandemic. And we've seen this with influenza 
HIV is a worldwide pandemic um, for sure. And of course, COVID-19 was a worldwide pandemic. So many of the things we've talked about in here are what we call zoonotic diseases. They are infections of animals that can be transmitted to humans. And like I said, the pathogens that cause this, they might or might not cause the animal to have a disease. Uh, many of these are the uh, result of direct or indirect, what we call spillover events, where humans come into contact with animals and disease is transmitted and then spread throughout the human population. Uh, we have things like uh, Lyme disease, the um, pathogen doesn't cause any disease in its animal host, but when it's uh, spread to uh, humans, uh, then it does cause a disease. Ebola is also one uh, that causes the animal host to die and also the human host to die. We've talked about Ebola's virulence, 50% chance of dying if you get Ebola. So that's a real scary one. Zoonotic diseases, this is where we're looking, right? This is where public health officials are looking for the newest diseases that are going to emerge. And we've seen that... Um, time and time again. COVID-19, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we think that's come from interactions between humans and bats. Uh, influenza viruses, two different strains of influenza virus can each infect a pig, so it's got two different types of flu virus in it, and then those bits of virus recombine and transfer bits of their genomes to one another and create a more infectious deadly strain that then the farmer can contract from interacting with the pig. And that can lead to an epidemic and a pandemic of influenza. We've seen bird flu, H1N1, um, things like this. Okay, so we have many ways that uh, infectious agents Infectious microbes can be spread around. Insect vectors can horizontally transmit diseases from animals to humans. Uh, that'd be a zoonotic disease. We do have vertical transmission. The pathogen goes from uh, the uh, parent to offspring, usually mother, into the fetus. Um, and then disease reservoirs, this is where pathogens hang out when they're not infecting us. Then we have endemic diseases. These are always present in an area, usually at a low number. Epidemic is when the number of cases ramps up in a, in a community. Uh, and then a pandemic is when that spreads worldwide. Okay, that's it for 2.3.